After a close loss in Sacramento on Sunday, the Heat were back at it on Monday night, this time taking on the Golden State Warriors, the team with the best record in the NBA, with Miami still missing key players throughout the roster. The result was somewhat predictable, a 115-108 loss. We'll break down the game. Tyler Hero struggles as a starter, and yet another Jimmy Butler injury and how that could impact the Heat. All that coming up next. You are locked on Heat. Your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, Heat Nation. It's a Tuesday edition of Locked On Heat, your daily podcast covering all things Miami Heat. However, you may be listening on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app. Thank you so much for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. I'm David Ramil, and with me, as always, is my co host, Wes Goldberg. Miami didn't have much time to think about a tough loss to the Kings on Sunday, taking on the Warriors on Monday night and getting some good news before the game that P.J. Tucker, who had missed time due to injury and then was in the health and safety protocols, would travel to San Francisco from Houston to play for Miami. He would come off the bench in his return, easing his way back and also being the de facto backup center with Miami's depth in the front court being so thin. So the starting lineup consisted of the same as it was in Sacramento. Kyle Lowry, Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, Caleb Martin, and Omer Yurtseven. And Miami caught a break as MVP candidate Steph Curry picked up two fouls in the first three minutes of the game, except that might actually have hurt Miami as Jordan Poole came in for Curry and hit two three-pointers to build up a Golden State lead of eight. Omer Yurtseven also exited the game early in the first, getting a cut above his left eye that required some stitches. He went to the locker room to get that taken care of. He would come back later in the game. But the Heat stayed in it, getting some big shots from Hero, Lowry, and even Chris Silva, who came off the bench for Yurtseven. And Caleb Martin hit two back-to-back threes to give Miami their first lead of the game. As the Warriors, though, they stormed back and took a five-point lead at the half. Eric Spolster kept the same starting lineup despite Hero's defensive struggles in the first half. And the move paid off with Miami staying close and yet another Martin three-pointer giving the Heat a two-point lead. But then, with just over two minutes left in the third quarter, Jimmy Butler drove toward the restricted area, planted his right foot in an awkward manner, crumpled to the floor immediately, and had to be helped off the court. What looked to be a seriously potentially season-ending injury was later reported by the Heat as a right-angle injury, although the severity of the injury is obviously unknown at this time. We'll talk about it later on the show. Tyler Hero, three-pointer at the buzzer, cut Golden State's lead to six after three quarters, and in the fourth, it looked that the Warriors were taking advantage and pushed the lead to 10, but Miami just wouldn't give up. They kept coming back, getting big shots from Hero, Kyle Guy, and P.J. Tucker, who hit two three-pointers in the quarter, but Miami just couldn't get any consistent defensive stops or scoring, and the end result was a 115-108 loss to drop Miami's record to 23-15. and Wes, we'll talk about Jimmy's injury and the potential impacts of that later on in the show, and of course, we'll be giving out our player grades as we do after every recap, but what are your overall thoughts of this game? Yeah, I thought in a game where the Heat were without 10 of their players on the second night of a back-to-back on a West Coast swing, this was a scheduled loss if there's ever been a scheduled loss, right? Especially considering that you're going against the best team in the NBA. And despite that, I thought that, you know, the final score, losing by seven points, all things considered, not the worst way to lose. And uh, the Heat had a chance late in that game. To me, this was a turning point, uh, David. I thought Miami actually could have won this game had they made a couple of plays right in the middle of that fourth quarter. Um, there's There was a point where Kyle Lowry goes to the line, his free throws make it a five-point game with 537 left to play. And this yeah. is with Steph Curry on the bench. Steph t- tends to rest this season in that middle portion of the fourth quarter. Um, with, so with Steph out, the Heat down five with five and a half minutes to go, that was, the po- that was your opportunity. Kyle Lowry was in the game. Tyler Hero was in the game. That was the opportunity for Miami to make a run and potentially take control of that game or at least get back in front. Uh, instead, they don't. And right. by the time Steph checks back into the game with 310 left to play, they're actually down six instead of down five. So what could have been a run, they actually uh, go deeper into that that hole that they were in. Instead of taking advantage in those two-plus minutes, uh, it becomes an advantage for Golden State. And look, I know that Steph didn't have a great game, right? I think his... His stat line was as much a story as this game as anything else. You could talk about how the Heat played and their injuries or whatever, but Steph scoring nine points on three for 17 shooting, one for 10 from three-point range. You can give Miami's defense some credit. 
But there's no defense that holds Steph to that, How good, no matter how good it is. Some of that is also yeah. Steph just being off. I kind of thought both teams were a little off, by the way, in this game. But um, the fact that Miami wasn't blown out in this game, it speaks to something. I'm still not sure exactly what it is. Like I said, both teams were a little off. It was an off game for Steph. It was just a weird game overall. But this yeah. was also a game that the Heat had an opportunity to win, and they didn't make the big plays down the stretch to actually get the game. Yeah, the team doesn't really believe much in moral victories, and I know our listeners and viewers don't either, but this was probably as close as you're going to get. They tried their best. This was a team that was really only missing Clay Thompson and James Wiseman as far as injuries concerned. So the team that has the best record in the NBA, mostly healthy. They got Draymond Green back from health and safety protocols. This was his return to action. He was a hugely impactful player. Although, of course, yeah, he, he just he doesn't score much. Only five points, two of five from the floor. But just directing so much of the defense, you saw it for two years. You know what it's like. I mean, Draymond, one of my favorite players to watch just because his stats just don't come off the the, the, the screen at all. Yeah. Uh, the box score, they don't really stand out. But he just he, he impacts the game. Like, 13 Spo- assists for him. He was a plus yeah. 10, which was <laughs> behind only Andrew out, yeah. Wiggins, who was a plus 13. And talk about, I mean, this was, all again, a weird game. Andrew Wiggins, 10 points in the first quarter. I think Golden State's first eight points, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. All of which Absolutely. came... At least uh, uh, it appeared to me against Kyle Lowry. And there was some oh, interesting yeah. matchups that Miami decided to go with. And we'll talk about Caleb Martin being on Steph in the player grades later on. But uh, and how great of a job he did. But that kind of pushes Kyle Lowry somewhere else in the lineup. And they, I guess the Heat coaches decided to put Kyle Lowry on Andrew Wiggins. The Warriors decided that that was a mismatch right early on. And they were right. Which is weird because it's Andrew Wiggins and it's Kyle Lowry. And you wouldn't, and I know that Wiggins has a size advantage there, but considering both of those players' reputations, you wouldn't think that the Golden State could just start feeding Wiggins early, but they did. And they yeah. did it often. And it's, it kind of established an early tempo of the game for the Warriors and kind of built out an early lead. Golden State outscoring Miami 33 to 25 in that first quarter before Miami was able to kind of claw their way back into the game. Again, just a bunch of weird stuff happening. It was, yeah, this wasn't the typical matchup for Lowry, especially when he's going up against a big where he can use his size and, and kind of his, his you know, stocky nature, his strength to be able to keep a, a big off the, the block or anything like that. Wiggins using a, an array of turnaround jumpers or even just be able to use a drop step to get to the rim. Caught a few lobs as well. Had the three-pointer going as well, two of four. I think he had 20 points in the first half and then just two points in the second. But either way, he had that kind of, again, that, that tone-setting first half there. Uh, it was really, really strange game. Hero struggled mightily offensively yeah. as well. Uh, went 7 of 23, but most of those shots felt like they came late in the game when Miami was trying to claw their way back. You knew he would find some confidence eventually. This is Tyler hero we're talking about but his struggles were pretty noticeable there and, and look from the Golden State Warriors we could talk about Miami and their de- you know, deficiencies all night long but you have to give cr- credit to Golden State they're a really good team obviously I'm not breaking news here by saying this their record speaks for itself they've got some great talent there on a night when Steph struggled they still got some great contributions from other players you talked about Draymond yeah uh, you know Jordan Poole came in and had a nice game for them Nemanja Bjelica unfortunately came in and hits a couple big shots for the Warriors as well. Their off-ball movement was so great all night long. Spo referenced it. Can I make a point to that? Just Absolutely. One, yeah, yeah. These, to me, when when the Heat are healthy, uh, and, but, and I think that these are the two teams who do the best at off-ball movement in the NBA. I don't think that That's there are two point. teams in the league that move off the ball. That doesn't. They're both really, really great passing teams. I think there are there are potentially better passing teams just at passing in the NBA. But as far as the off-ball movement, the constant movement, the way that you, if you're a high school coach and you want to coach your high school team, you're showing your team film on Golden State and on Miami because of all the cutting, all the interesting screen things that they do, um, all all the intricacies. It's not, they don't run a ton of plays. It's a lot of sort of sort of read and react kind of offense for them. Um, And they both switch a ton defensively and it just, it lends itself to this beautiful form of basketball. And I just can't wait for hopefully both of these teams to be healthy because Golden State will have Clay Thompson back. Hopefully by then the Heat will be healthy by March uh, when these two teams play again in Miami. I'm really, really hoping that that is a game where both of these teams are healthy because it's our only opportunity to really see these two teams on the court together. And I just think it has a, a, a the potential to be just a really, really fun game. And this was, I know we keep using the word weird here, David, and, and you know, Miami kind of staying in it despite being as shorthanded as they were. 
This was a fun yeah. game. And I'm, you know, for a night where we, you and I had to stay up until one in the morning to watch it here on the East Coast, I, I'm glad it was one of these games and it wasn't a 20 point <laughs> blowout or something like that. Like, I'm glad it was at least entertaining to watch because I found it entertaining to watch. It, it did have that potential, but you're right. Golden State style of play, uh, you know, it's very interesting. There's just multiple actions. Uh, you know, they, they Miami would switch. They'd be able to stop the initial drive to the hoop, and then they would, you know, flare out to a wide-open shooter, or somebody would drive again and then set somebody up, and then there would be an instant double team or somebody would have to close out, and then all of a sudden you'd have this wide-open layup. A guy like Gary Payton the second, or even mm -hmm. Wiggins on a couple drives to the hoop getting some nice looks there. Yeah, both of these teams are aces that, like, finding those guys, who were just sort of role player journeyman Gary Payton the second for Golden State Caleb Martin for Miami they're just like a Kyle guy right now for them I mean they're just yeah. finding these guys putting them in good roles uh and and helping them succeed because they both of these teams I covered the Warriors and I'm covering the heat now obviously and one of the things that both these coaching staffs always say is we focus on what players can do and we give them opportunities right. to do that we have roles and we kind of try to find players that potentially could fit into those roles, but they're always focusing on what players can do. And I think that's the mark of a really good coaching staff while also helping them develop on those, uh, what they double down on what they do great and yep. helping round out the rest of their games. Absolutely. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about Jimmy Butler's uh, injury because that's, I think the biggest story of the game, as good as Miami played and as much of a, a great effort as they gave, there are still concerns about Jimmy and that ankle that keeps recurring uh, as far as the injury is concerned. So we'll talk about the potential impacts on the road. And of course, we'll give our player grades in the next segment. But first, just a reminder that this episode of Locked on Heat is brought to you by Truebill. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel. Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in just one tap. Truebill has over 2 million users. It's helped save them over $100 million. You could be next. Like Matthew B., who says, in a matter of seconds, I saved $660 for the year on my DirecTV bill. I saved $120 for the year on my Sirium XM bill, Sirius XM bill, and I saved $840 a year on car insurance. Incredible. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now to Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. That's Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, back here with Locked On Heat. Thank you for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Okay, boys and girls, it is time for report cards, and we are starting with Caleb Martin, who, and you know the rules here, David, nobody gets an A and a loss, but Caleb Martin getting a B plus once again uh, for his role as a starter tonight, specifically for his defense on Steph Curry. Uh, before jumping into that a little bit here, Caleb Martin, 19 points on yep. 8 for 14 shooting, 3 for 5 from 3-point range, 9 rebounds, an assist, 2 steals, a block. He was a minus 5 in the game. Don't care about that in his 36 minutes because what he did def the what he did defensively on Steph. Eric Spolster deciding to start Caleb Martin on Steph Curry just like he decided to start Caleb Martin on De'Aaron Fox on Sunday night. Uh, there is a belief in Caleb Martin by this coaching staff that he's a guy that you can now put on opposing ball handlers, on opposing point guards, fast yeah. point guards who run the floor well, who run around the floor well in the case of Steph. Uh, this is a guy who's sort of starting in place for P.J. Tucker, ostensibly, right, yeah. at the four, but they're putting him on ones right now over the last couple of games. And with Wednesday's game in Portland coming up, you got to believe that they're probably going to slot Caleb Martin on Damian Lillard. They have no reason not to, right, because right. of what he was able to do Look, De'Aaron Fox had a nice game, but, I mean, nobody was stopping De'Aaron Fox. But what he, what Caleb Martin was able to do against Steph, right. Steph Curry coming into this game, shooting 40% on threes, averaging 27.7 points per game, with Caleb Martin draped all over him for most of the game. And I understand that Miami switches a lot, and so it's not always Caleb Martin against Steph, but starting possessions or as many possessions as you can with Caleb Martin on him, just chasing him around, face guarding him all night. Steph Curry, nine points on three for 17, shooting one for 10 from three-point range. Um, 
he forces Steph into more of a playmaking role. Steph has 10 assists for the game. But if you're able to do that to Steph Curry, that's the reason why. We could, we could talk about all these other things that the Heat did, and we will, and we have. But really, when it comes down to it, Steph a little bit off with this shot, but also Caleb Martin, give him credit, putting pressure on him early, applying that early yep. pressure to take him out of his rhythm, a rhythm that Steph was never really able to find. A lot of credit goes to Caleb. Absolutely. I, I think there was an initial kind of, I don't know, kind of sort of like a defensive back sort of putting pressure right at the line or something like that. Like you make an initial contact, kept Curry from going into his multiple screen actions. And even when he did, I think he did a great job, Martin did, of fighting over screens, putting a hand in his face. Obviously, he's got a size advantage over Curry. He's got some length there. And it just it, it felt like he was making an impact. I think Curry was off, to your point, absolutely. But I think you have to give credit to Caleb for doing a really good job. But look, the offense is certainly coming around. This was a player who was in health and safety protocols a week ago, uh, and he's bounced back remarkably well. It has He has not missed a step. Uh, as Spo talked about him in his postgame presser, Everybody keeps – we can't help but rave about what Caleb Martin is doing. This is a two-way player who the Charlotte Hornets, who are a much worse team than Miami Heat, didn't need. They couldn't maximize his talent. They kept his other brother on his roster, the, the, on the roster, his twin. And yet Miami has taken this player and turned him into an incredibly useful player, impactful defensively, as you pointed out. Offensively, he's making big shots to help Miami take the lead twice throughout the game. That's huge. Yeah. Uh, again, if he can't get an A because it's a loss – he gets as close as he can possibly get. Let's move now to Tyler Hero, who gets an F for the game. You hate to see uh, Tyler getting such a poor grade, his worst grade of the season, because it's been such a great season for him, and that's why I'm grading him so harshly. Now, maybe yeah. you say 18 points, four assists. How could you give this guy an F? Well, it took him 23 shots, seven for 23 overall, four for 13 from three-point range. And here's the thing that really stood out to me, David, more than the box score. He just never really seemed to know what it is that he wanted to do on the court tonight. And yeah. he just seemed completely lost out there. He didn't know how to navigate screens. He didn't know how to call. You didn't know when he wanted to uh, call guys up to set picks, when he wanted to try to initiate a switch from Golden State's defense. That 100% switches basically all the time. If you want to get a switch against Golden State, you can get one. And it just felt like he never really knew what he wanted to do on the court. And you contrast that to the next guy I want to talk about, Kyle Lowry who kind of always is in control, right? And that's the thing about Lowry. That's not a surprising thing. He's always so in so much control. I understand why it would be hard for a young guy like Tyler Hero playing with all these new te teammates, guys like t on 10-day contracts like Chris Silva, who is in there for a bulk of his minutes um, and, all those, and all that stuff, how you're like, yeah, yeah, I don't really know where I fit with all these guys, but you're a Tyler yeah. Hero, and these dudes are on 10 days. You make them fit with you, not the other way around. And I just thought that Tyler Hero had a really hard time finding his rhythm tonight. Uh, and he wasn't playing with that swagger and all that stuff that he keeps talking about. It just wasn't there. Yeah. Aside from that three-point shot to end the third quarter, <laughs> mostly a pretty bad night for him. Uh, he, it did look really lost out there. I'm glad you brought that up because – he is struggling with that starting lineup, and we've talked about yes. it before, whether or not he's just more effective coming off the bench. Miami just doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of options yet. Something, again, we'll talk about in the next segment. But for now, Tyler looked lost. He threw passes into the crowd. He just looked out of control, wasn't sure what to do with that dribble, bobbled it a number of occasions. And again, tip your hat to Draymond Green and the rest of the Warriors defenders because they just seemed to challenge him. They knew he was going to be a focal point of their offense, and he just wasn't able to get it right. going at any point in time. He looked dysfunctional from start to finish, and while he was able to bolster some of these stats, they were mostly empty numbers that he put up in the second half to help Miami keep the pace. He's not a pace setter yet, and that's a problem because Miami – Still needs him to come off the bench. It's one thing to have that role when you can come up and be that that spark plug off the bench or help Miami kind of cut into a lead or maybe even establish an even bigger lead. Maybe, of course, you know how he's built differently, as Eric Spolster is fond of saying. He comes in in clutch situations late in the game. He'll knock down a couple shots here and there. That's all fine and good. He's just not capable of taking over a game offensively. Not yet, especially against a defense as good well, as Golden State's. That's the thing. The, the, the Golden State defense is really – hard uh, or, or real hard to play against and, and um and I don't I don't love bringing up the starter versus the bench stats but because we're having the conversation I I, I suppose it's it's somewhat relevant in and, and the reason I don't love to bring it up is because it's such a small sample as a starter and you're getting games sure. like this when it's you know you're depleted you're playing with a depleted supporting cast and it's against you know the best defense in the NBA in Golden State but whatever in right. 9 games as a starter Tyler Hero shooting 38 and a half percent 29.9% from three-point range, 
Uh, four and a half or, or 4.4 assists to 3.4 turnovers is not a great assist to turnover ratio there. Just a plus 1.3 on average in those games. 22 games off the bench, 45.9% shooting, hmm. 43.8% shooting. So up from, so he's basically 30% off uh, as a starter from three, 44% off the bench from three. That's a drastic difference. Yeah. 3.8 assists to 2.6 turnovers, a marginally better ratio there. Plus 2.2, almost twice as good uh, as far as the uh, the plus minus is concerned. So, uh, again, I don't love going to that. It's such a small sample, and there's so much noise in those numbers uh, when he's a starter. But I all those things that you're talking about, some of that eye test stuff, it's worth keeping in mind for now. I'm not sure he's not I, – I think he could take over games at times. I still think he's able to do that. I don't know if it matters whether or not he's a starter – or coming off the bench. Um, but fair. tonight was not a step in the right direction. When you're looking at Tyler Hero as a potential, you know, foundational piece. Again, he's young. These things sure. happen. He's not going to hit a home run every single night. But uh, this was not his best night, for sure. Absolutely. All right, let's move on. Lastly, to talk about Kyle Lowry. You mentioned it before. Yeah. Usually impactful. Uh, I think he had a big night. Although it was somewhat quiet as far as Heat fans Sanders are concerned. Well, look, again, nobody gets an A in a loss, but he's going to get as close as possible. A B plus plus plus. <laughs> We're getting as close to an A as we can get here, David, because yeah. I thought he played the game that Miami needed him to play. And maybe okay. some Heat fans want him to go out there and drop 30. The fact of the matter is that's just not Kyle Lowry. That's not his game. It never really was, right? We talk, we hear all this time about Toronto Kyle Lowry. This was Toronto Kyle Lowry. This was yeah. him. 16 points on 4 for 13 shooting, 2 for 9 from 3-point range. Again, not as efficient maybe as you'd like, especially from three-point range, but 11 assists. He was the only Heat player with a positive mark and plus minus. He was a plus two for the game. The eight turnovers, not great. The five personal fouls, not awesome, although it didn't have an impact on his game because he ended up playing 39 minutes, so there was no impact yeah. there on the second night right. of a back-to-back, -back, mind you. But right. uh, he was in control of this game, playing with a, a skeleton crew of guys who he's barely played with. Uh, I thought he did as much as possible to stay in control of this game, David, against yeah. a, a Golden State Warriors team that likes to force opponents into situations of chaos. Well, we know yep. that Kyle Lowry thrives in that chaos. He did so tonight. He kept the heat in the game as much as he possibly could. A couple of those shots drop, a floater here, a layup here, a three-pointer there. And next thing you know, the Heat are right in it. Maybe even finding a way to steal this game uh, and and beat Golden State. But overall, just a big impactful night for Lowry. I like the way he was working with Miami's bigs, working the pick and roll, yes. taking an active approach and trying to get the most out of Chris Silva. Like looking, like he was he looked functional out there as an offensive role man. Something that you don't quite expect from Chris Silva. And it's completely due to the fact that Lowry was spoon-feeding him, feeding him, guiding him expertly, keeping both defenders at bay, working the pick-and-roll so masterfully. That's what he does best. He, you know, again, slightly different. You know that you're going to get a bucket from Kyle, I mean, from, from Tyler. With Kyle, it's more about dominating the game in a different way. He controls right. things. He moves chess pieces around in a way that uh, a young player like Hero can't do just yet. Something that Jimmy can do as well. Unfortunately, Jimmy not quite able to do so throughout the game. And, and you know, I, I don't know. It's just a big game from Lowry. I really yeah. liked watching him play. He did have moments where he was aggressive. He got to the line also. Six of seven from the free throw line. He was. Uh, I mean, him and Jimmy Butler both got to the line effectively. The Heat, in general, took even more free throws than Golden State because so much of their offense was just based on this off-ball movement. And it's just a tough game, as you said before, maybe even a scheduled loss. And somehow Miami found a way to kind of grit it out. And they, they played their best, and it just wasn't enough. You know, they couldn't get enough sustained offense from guys like Hero, Lowry, and others. No, you're right. And again, it was a treat watching Kyle Lowry and Draymond Green, two guys who are very, very similar in approach, right? Just yeah, that's so much point. control of the game, just always getting guys involved. So great defensively, all those things. Um, just, uh, but you know, it wasn't enough. Kyle Lowry needs some help. But what happens with Jimmy Butler? When does he come back, and how does it impact the Miami Heat? Well, we'll talk about that in the next segment here on Locked On Heat. Just a reminder that you can always reach us via email at lockedonheat at gmail .com or via Twitter using the hashtag AskHelloHeat. Be sure to please subscribe to the show and leave a review. Thank you so much to all of you who have subscribed to our channel on YouTube and to our podcast. 
We always could use the support, so keep doing that whenever possible. But, you know, the question, I think, for a lot of Heat fans, Wes, as we're watching this game, gritty as it was, tough effort, moral victory, whatever you want to call it, but Jimmy Butler crumpling to the floor, not a good sight there. And I texted you, I thought, you know, I, I'm going to say what a lot of Heat fans don't want to hear. I thought it was right. a potential uh, Achilles injury. It looked like it was just so sudden, something that you're not used to seeing from Jimmy. If he's going to roll that ankle badly, he's going to fall. He's going to try to grit it out. That wasn't the case. Like asking for help, he couldn't get off the floor of his own volition. Kind of a scary sight there. A potentially season-ending injury. And luckily, luckily, and I hate to say it when we're talking about a player's health at this point, but you know, it seems like it's just going to be an ankle injury, and who knows the severity of it. I mean, right. I guess worst case scenario, could he require surgery? Maybe at this point, it just feels like it's a recurring thing with that same right ankle. He keeps rolling. Uh, some people criticizing Dwayne Wade's leaning shoes as a potential culprit <laughs> in the situation there. I don't know if it's I don't know if we're at that point yet, but uh, a lot of people just unhappy yeah. with the fact that Jimmy went down and, and how soon he'll be able to come back to the floor. So yeah. what do you think? I mean, how do we even start this conversation? Well, I, go ahead. First of all, the leaning shoes thing doesn't make sense to me. D'Angelo Russell wears those shoes. He's not dealing with right ankle sprains either. So hmm. um, not a thing that I'm concerned about. But the right ankle okay. I am concerned about. And I am concerned about Jimmy Butler's injury history because he has this air of being this tough guy. And I'm not saying he's not. But he's a guy who has dealt with a ton of injuries, not just this season, but over the last couple of years, David. And I think it's something that yeah. we need to start really talking about, like having a conversation about and being aware of instead of sort of kind of falling for whatever narrative there is out there. And I don't love using that word narrative, but it, it's sort of out there with Jimmy Butler. You could be tough, but also injury prone, right? That exists. That's and that's where Absolutely. Jimmy Butler is. Look, this is – he. You look back on his list of injuries and Fox Sports, I think it is, does like a good job. You just Google Jimmy Butler uh, injuries, in, list of injuries, and like the Fox Sports link will come up. Go click on it. This right ankle was giving him a problem a year ago, December yeah. of last year. Well, two years ago now because we're in January of 2022. This right ankle was an, in, was, was an injury that he was dealing with. Since then, a left foot, a knee, an ankle injury, a back injury, an ankle injury, a tailbone injury, an ankle injury, and now, again, that right ankle is sprained again. I don't know how long he'll be out. He'll probably miss Wednesday's game. That's my guess. Because when you re-aggravate that right ankle that he just came yeah. back from, the chances of the Heat putting him back out there against Portland, pretty slim. Um, mm -hmm. But this is something that I'm concerned about with Jimmy Butler. Like, It's not just like, – this is an older veteran team. And you have, and it comes with its advantages. The biggest disadvantage is exactly what we've seen for the first 30 plus games of the season for the Heat is dudes get hurt. And Jimmy Butler is getting hurt more than anybody else right now. And it's, right. it's just something that we need to be aware of because he is Miami's best player when everybody is healthy and all things are equal and he's on the floor. Yeah, uh, a freak injury. I mean, just he planted, went, we, you know, turned that ankle in an odd way. Uh, hopefully he bounces back, but I've been saying this for years. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy's feet, lower extremities. And again, I'm not doctor or anything like that. And I can only say what I've seen with my own eyes in the days before COVID, before the season shut down uh, and the bubble and everything else back in, what was it? 2020. I can't even remember now exactly what it was. What going to that locker room and seeing Jim, like just trying to limp his way post game, regardless of the game he had, not because of any injury or anything like that, just because well, it hurts to play basketball at this point in his career. And you knew that there was always something wrong. There was going to be these nagging injuries that just kept piling up. Yeah. And that's just been the case. And they've continued to pile up because of the increased minutes, the increased usage, everything else. This is the curse of being a superstar player is that you have the ball in your hands. You have to create a lot. And if you can't stay healthy, if you can't get that health back, it's just, it's going to keep piling up. So I, I'm concerned. Look, Wednesday, you're right. Likely to uh, sit out that game. I think the next game is, what, Saturday night against the Phoenix Suns? Yeah. So maybe he has enough time to come back from them. At this point, does it even matter? Again, against like a team like Phoenix, as good as they are, maybe you'd rather just sit that uh, sit Jimmy down because this might be right. another potential. Well, I, did, I heard block. some people on – I mean, look, Heat Twitter is a minority of Heat fans here, but people sure. saying how – why do you even have Jimmy Butler in this game? It's a scheduled loss, all this stuff. Why is he even playing in these games? Well, That's because it's the NBA season and there's a game on the schedule and he's healthy and you play him. That's why. Yeah. It's not it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science here. There are no scheduled losses to a team, even though there is a scheduled loss, and this was very much one of them. But um, I look, if Jimmy Butler's available Wednesday night, he's gonna play. play. If he's healthy enough to yeah. play, he'll play. There's no 
The, the, the stuff doesn't work this way where you're preventing injuries by not having a player play. If he's healthy, he's healthy. If he's available, yeah. if he's healthy enough to play, he's healthy enough to play. That's it. Um, as far yeah. as the nagging injuries are concerned, I don't know if there's a way to fix it. I don't know if it's taking playing time down or giving him rest. I don't know. If we don't know the nature or the details of these injuries. If it was easy as doing that, they probably would have done that. I don't like the yeah. Heat aren't like not okay with resting. They rest players all the time. Sure. Like maintenance it's, program, Dwayne Wade. Yeah, exactly. If it was something that could help, maybe it's something that could, they could still explore as Jimmy Butler gets older and these nagging injuries start to pile up. But uh, for now, it doesn't seem to be their mo. Um, but kind of zooming out uh, on this a little bit, David. I mean, this was this is a really tough blow if he has to miss time because we were just on the cusp of Miami getting healthy. All these guys are about to get out of protocols. There's a chance that you get Max Drews, Udonis Haslam, Duncan Robinson, Gabe Vincent, and Marcus Garrett all testing out of protocols by Wednesday night's game in Portland. P.J. Tucker flew from uh, his quarantine into San uh, into San Francisco right. tonight to be th- when he tested out of protocols to be there for tonight's game, and he played. Uh, so you can get all these guys out of protocols. You're getting Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, and, and Kyle Lowry healthy. Before this yeah. recent stretch, Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry hadn't played together in a game since December 6th. And I wrote about this uh, in my latest newsletter that came out Monday morning, westgoldberg.substack.com for the West Side. And, um, you know, everybody was going to be back except for, you know, Bam Adebayo, who right. is due back in mid-January. Markeith Morris, who remains out. Victor Oladipo hasn't played this season yet. Um, but you're sort of starting to ramp up to maybe getting a full squad by the time this Heat team gets back from this road trip. And I don't, again, Spo said after the game, they will test Jimmy Butler. They'll evaluate him on Tuesday and, and, and on Wednesday before the game in Portland. But um, if he has to miss significant time, now you're losing your best player right on the cusp of getting all your guys basically back by mid-January. And so tying everything together, even as we're talking about this, there's the potential that maybe Duncan comes back or Max Struess comes back. And likely one of those will probably be inserted into the starting lineup. Maybe both of them will be inserted into the starting line, or maybe you bring PJ Tucker back. It depends. Uh, and, and if that's the case, uh, then, you know, Tyler can continue coming off the bench and maybe he'll find a way to flourish again as a backup against Portland. Uh, it's a, an interesting yeah. proposition. Right now, if you had to guess, I mean, again, we don't know who's going to be available or not. Let's assume the full contingent of players comes back. Would Tyler be starting on Wednesday, in your opinion? Um, no, because I, I, I think if Duncan or Max test out of protocols that they'll move Tyler back to the bench uh, because well, they needed gotta, him. You, they needed him tonight. Yeah. Um, you got to start. You got to find two new starters then because Jimmy's out too. So who replaces Jimmy and then who yeah. replaces Tyler? Or do you put, I, I think PJ Tucker. Tucker and Caleb Martin plus either Duncan or Max Struess. Good point. Yeah. Cause Caleb does play in place of Jimmy at right. times. So he'll be starting in place of Jimmy. PJ will take his normal spot at the four, even though of course, of course that center position continues to be a weak spot for Miami and then either Max or Duncan insert into the starting lineup. So we'll see what happens. Of course, we'll have a recap for you after Wednesday night games. We're staying up late in case you don't have to or can't. And I totally understand why you wouldn't be able to tomorrow. We'll be recording a mailbag or episode of the show. We've still got some questions, some, t- some space there. If you've got questions, questions about the team or injuries or any potential trades or anything like that of course send them our way we'll be happy to answer them for the show but that will do it for now thank you so much for making locked on heat your first listen every day remember that every episode is always free and available wherever you get the show so make sure you subscribe to get the best coverage available make sure to also check out locked on bets your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs this is david ramel signing off for now thanks so much for joining me wes go to sleep b (laughs) 